time is now. Let everyone in the listening audience grab their scriptures, a pencil, and a piece of paper. Listen and learn the true meaning of the Old and New Testament of the Bible, the Psalms of David, the Lost Book, and the Holy Quran. There are no more secrets. All false things will perish. So come and learn the undisputable teachings of the only man that has the answer to the problems of the troubled world, as Sayyid and Mama Isa and Hadi and Ma. It is prophesied in a previous quote, Genesis, the 400-year bondage of the Amas will expire in the year 2000 AD, but only if we are successful in our mission of raising the 144,000. Since this is prophesied, it is not certain that the prophecy will be fulfilled because it says here, but only if we are successful in our mission. I, I thought that um, if a prophecy, since it's prophesied that it should be no doubt that the prophecy should be fulfilled. You know what I noticed about that statement? Everybody asks about the end, but they don't ask about the beginning. It was also mentioned in our books that it was prophesied that the world would end in 1970 and that the four winds were going to fold, but that there was an intercession from the, from the uh, seraphim to hold back the four angels of the four winds until you are sealed in your head. That's also in the book of Revelation. Nobody seems to ask about how prophecy was altered on your own. Always ask about how, how would it not be altered to your disadvantage. You follow what I'm saying? And what they got to realize is that in the Holy Quran, in the 110th surah of the Quran, it came as Bismillahi ar-Rahmani ar-Rahim. Iza ja. The first word Iza alif the alif means if as well as when. Most translators say when the help comes, but Iza in front of a past tense ja can be if or when. Iza ja nasrullah walfat. If the aid is of Allah. Come. That means if you raise the Nasrullahi, 144,000, if you raise them, what will happen? But before they tell you what will happen, they tell you what to look for. Wara eight and nafi, yada khuluna, fi deen alahi, afwajan, izaja nasrullahi wal fat. When or if the A and the victorious opening happens, when Ansar Allah comes, wa and wara eight and nafi, yada khuluna, and you see people entering into deen alahi, afwajan in groups, like y'all are now beginning to take shahada in groups in this latter day. Then it says what? فَسَبَّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ So then it is time for you to glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by showing hamda, gratitude. Start worshiping five times a day, in other words, to show your gratitude, right? فَسَبَّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَسَغْفِرُهُ And you must ask Allah to forgive you for your idolatry, and your fornications and abominations and seek his forgiveness in the who can because he's the only one that has the power to forgive you 
when he turned to him for repentance. This is what that section is about. This was the last revelation that came to Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The last thing in the Quran this is the last revelation in itself as a whole surah. It came to him. And it was speaking about this latter day when this would happen. When and or if you do that. Now, here's the reality of it though. The Nasrullah has come. And so our mission is here. And the victorious seal has been opened. And truth, like Daniel spoke about in Daniel's eyes, but it was sealed away, it's been revealed to y'all people. Y'all know almost everything y'all need to know. Y'all got so many facts. But the next statement is Wara eight and nafi yadda khuluna fi deen Allahi afwajan. Next is are y'all entering into Yadahu. The word dakhala means to enter inside something. To go inside, dakhala, idhul. If you was knocking at my door and I said, Mindal Ba, who's at the door? And you said, This is Ali, I said, Idhul. Come into my house. You understand? The same word. Dal lam Dakhala. To enter in. But when the Quran makes this statement, Wara eight nafi yadakhuluna fi deen Allahi afwaja. All of a sudden y'all don't understand that part. <laughs> you see? Y'all I don't understand this. It's just coming in part. I'm sorry Allah community is here. We are proving that now that the truth has come, the false things are perishing. Because all the other Sunni Muslim organizations and all the other groups and are fading away, and the only thing that's still standing here from the 60s is us. The only ones that's still putting out new messages, new pamphlets, and new truths, and new facts is us. Jimmy Swag and all these people are falling to the wayside. All the stuff you believe in, the Jehovah's Witness, everybody's falling. We're still the ones standing here telling you all the truth. Correct? True or false? This is, this is a fact. Now we are here. Are you as Nas? The word Nas means people. It says, and when you see this, what are Aka and Nas, when you see the people, what will they be doing? They will be coming in. Yet the Khalul of the Deen Allah, Yaqwajan. Joining in. It didn't say Deen Islam. It said Deen Allah. It didn't say join any school of thought or any group of people or visit the mosque just on Friday. It means you're going to be preoccupied. Full time. This is Deen Allah. This is not Deen Islam. Deen Islam you can do as a Sunni, as a, as a Shia, as an Ahmadiyya, as a Wahhabi, as an Ikhwani, as a Bilalian. But when you have the, you have the Khulun of Deen Allah, this is something you have made it your business. You're going to drop your nets and become fishes of men. That you're going to cut off all things pertaining to the world, this physical world, and start aspiring for the world to come. That you're going to take off the garb of unrighteousness and cloak yourself in the garb of righteousness and purity and be out propagating in the name of your Creator and asking to forgive us for our stupidity or the things or the times when you worship Jesus and thought he was God or you listened to some Maharaji and followed some yogi fanatic guy or you went and read some esoteric book and started studying Kabbalians and Kabbalists and a whole bunch of stuff that he didn't tell you to study. You're going to ask him to forgive you for that. Because he's the only one who has the power to accept repentance. You understand what I'm saying? But no, you all recognize Nasrullah being here. But when it comes down to Yad the Khuluna, the Deen Allah, you don't have all kinds of excuses for not joining in. Then, when it says, Fasab Das Bihamdu Rabbika, and so it's time when that happens for you to start glorifying Allah, that means making your five daily prayers, constantly praying to the Heavenly Father and glorifying Him. How many people in there make their five daily prayers every day? From Salatul Fajr all the way to Salatul Isha, every day. Or do you have some excuse, at my job I can't do it. I, at, at my work I can't do this. I have to take care of it. I have to do this here. I'm out in the street all the time. What did Jesus tell His followers? Drop their nets and become fishes of men. That means cut off those things so that you can devote yourself full time to the service of the Heavenly Father and raising His lost seed. So when you get to that part, the third best behind it, Abdika, and seek out his forgiveness, cause innahu kana tawada. Cause surely he is the only one that has the power to accept your repentance. We cut off, we shut down. We don't want to hear that side of it. We only want to hear the beautiful side of it, like the like the revelation said. We like the doctrine when it's sweet in our mouth, but not when it's bitter in our belly. It's sweet in our mouth, but we are in the corner, we and we blowing all this doctrine, and we sound heavy to our friends. But then when someone says, "Are you going to dress in white?" Are you going to put back on the garb of righteousness? Are you going to enter? Right? Tadkhul fi jami'a atu ansar Allah? Are you going to enter in to the ansar Allah community? Or are you going to stay out here on the streets and profess to be one of them and walk around in a state of hypocrisy and making up all kinds of excuses why you're not coming home yet and why you're not doing this? Which is it? Are you going in like Jesus or are you going to, are you going to pull a Nicodemus? Remember, Nicodemus never got back around Jesus until he got smart enough to realize to get Judas' body. The only time he would come to Jesus is at night. 
and talk to Jesus so nobody would see him. But he wouldn't walk with Jesus, sleep with Jesus, and break bread with Jesus, and be in amongst his disciples. Yet he wanted to classify himself one of Jesus' sacred disciples. But he wasn't there when the subject advanced because he never entered into the dean with him. You follow what I'm saying? So, uh, to answer to the sister's question, the prophecy can be altered. It was altered on your behalf in 1970, otherwise the four winds would have folded. It was altered that you may be saved. The lost upon what God would save you. Now what do you do with it? Do you turn from it or do you work with it? Um, another thing, um, you know, my mind was gone, but I chopped in a little bit about, you know, when brothers were speaking about as far as the last day and so on and so forth. Um, from my learning, and from what I believe, not by my opinion, or by what I feel, or anything like that, uh, there's some hadith to say everyone will have a taste of uh, the fire. Or, or Let me that. interrupt you for a minute. There's a good point you're trying to reach at. First of all, the most important thing is, my brother, is these translators play a trick on most people. In the Arabic language, when it says, kun fire kun, it doesn't mean the end is. The word kun, from yakunu, kana, means to exist, from Cohen, cosmos. Mm. And fire is from the word fi ya, to come All into. Right. Wait, just a minute, so you understand. Because mm -hmm. that's a very important word. When All Allah Ta'ala right. says, kun faya kun, what that means is when Allah wants to bring a thing into existence, He says, kun faya kun, exist, and into existence it comes. It has, nothing to do with, it has nothing to do with the work or the amal of men. What we do is we take a word and think it has to do with the way we do a thing. It has nothing to do with the way we act, how we make salah, it has nothing to do with how we dress, that has to do with bringing things into existence, new creations. Kun faya kun. So it's not as easy to say, well, if Allah just wants a thing to happen, it happens. And then when it comes down to numbers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does deal in numbers. He's very specific in the Quran that when Rasulullah alayhi salatu was under the oppression by the tribe of Quraysh who was coming out against him in the battle of Badr, that they had 315 followers and he sent down a thousand angels to assist them. If I were? Yeah, all right, but um, that's Ismaili, if I may, uh, no, or no due respect, if I may interrupt you. Um, my point is not so much numbers or uh, anything like that, uh, but what I know is what I know is that, you know, Allah is going to determine how, you know, how many people is going to make it. You see, because there are those who behave fitting to go to Shahana until they are better miles length away and they end up going to paradise, just as there are those who behave fitting to go to paradise until they are better miles length away and they end up going to Jahana. This is Hadith. This is okay, not, yes. This is uh, not Quran. If I may, if I may continue. Okay, go ahead. Okay. I love what you brothers are doing. Let me, let me interrupt you. Because it's going on and on and on and some things are thrown in. There's a difference in philosophy we have to clear so we don't leave the audience. The Holy Quran specifically points out to Rasulullah in the 106th surah that he's only dealing with one group of people here. Not everybody in the world. It's like Sunni Muslims have been brainwashed and taken. He says in that, in that Quran, Le ila fi Quraysh. He signals out a tribe of people called the Quraysh and says he's going to give them alfi, al thousands of protections for this one family, the Quraysh family, which is a Hashemi family, which is the sons of Ishmael and Abraham, which is the black seed from Noah. Because Allah does say in the Quran that Noah's family and Imran's family is above other nations of the world. So in the Quran, Allah does specifically point out that the black seed is superior to the white seed himself by mentioning Imran's family, which are black, which is Miriam and Isa and Musa and uh, Ibrahim, and look, what is pure seed of the Hamites, and in the Holy Quran when he speaks of the creation of Adam, he uses the word Ham and Sassalin, which is the same Arabic word as the name Ham for black. I created Adam of Ham and Sassalin, black mud. He specifically points out this. And though when I say it, it's racism, and when the white Arabs teach you all that the Prophet Muhammad is white in the Hadith, that's called history. You see, when I do it, it's a racist thing. When they yeah, do it, it's called history. But I want to point out to you that in this Quran, Allah says, La ila fi Quraysh. And he's setting out to send thousands of protections on the tribe of Quraysh. Ilah fi him rasat al-shita al-faith. That he's going to protect them as they mount their horses to set out on this journey. And now, he speaks about them having a journey that will take them through the winter and the summer, and that they will be in a place where they will have to turn to Mecca. Listen when he does that. He says, Sal ya'abdu rabbahad al-bayt ata'amahu min jo'in wa'amanahu min khalf. 
right? I love it. He puts in there. Now what that means is, so I want you people to worship your sustainer at this house, have a base, meaning up Mecca. Allah Ta'ala was telling us that he knew that we would be out of our home. We wouldn't be at Mecca. He wants us to worship there. He said, listen, from Abdu, from, Ab, from, Abdu, from Surah Al-Kafirun, when Rasulullah points out the Kafir from the Mu'min, he says, from Abdu, Rabba have a base. I want you all to worship your sustain Allah at this house, at Mecca. Allah di at'amahum min jo'ain, wa amanahum min khalf. The one who fed you when you were hungry and who gave to you when you were thirsty. And why he's talking about feeding us from hunger and thirst, he's going back to Nabi Ibrahim, wa azotatahu, Hagar. His wife, Hagar, was put out of the house of Abraham and went into the land of Quran, which is later called Mecca, or Becca, and they were fed with the, the well of Zamzam, and Allah Ta'ala provided for them with food to the angel Jibra'il, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. This, whether y'all want to accept it or not, in the Arabic, it's very clearly speaking to a specific race of people. And in Quran, Allah says, I myself have created you into tribes, and I have made you into families that you will know about each other. He uses Ya'arrafuna. He doesn't use Ya'lamuna, to know each other like the translators. He uses the word Arafa, to know about a thing, not to alama, to learn a thing. I want you to know the difference in each other. Ya'arrafuna. He says, and the best amongst you is he who's the most loyal. Now that's not race at all. That's tribe and family that has nothing to do with different races. The word for race is Iraq. That word race is not there. Just tribes and families. Who are they talking about? Nabi Ibrahim. They say to Abraham, Abraham, you are going to be broken up into because you are the Imam of all the Muslims. Remember that the Quran says that if you named us Muslim before Muhammad was here, and you're the father of tribes and families, Israel and Ishmael, which comes down into Kira, which is a family, and the Quraysh, and which goes down to Judah, which is a family of Ben Israel, which goes down to Isa. Your father, and the best between Israel and Ishmael and the Midians is he who is the most righteous. And out of them came Rasulullah who was black, blacker than you and I, a pure seed. Though the white Arabs have the Sunnis brainwashed and thinking he was white, he was a black man. It's a historical fact that he was black. There's drawings of him as black. And they have them subliminally worshipping them. And if I bring it up, I automatically become a racist. But in their hadith that these white Arabs put together, and they say the armpits of the Prophet Muhammad's white, his face was pink, he had a white beard, they give black people an a, a inferiority complex when all Sudanese have records of their descendancy charts directly from name to name from all the family of Rasulullah. And we know for a fact that he was a dark, dark Arab, a black man, not a red or pink. He didn't look like Qaddafi. He didn't look like Ayatollah Khomeini. He didn't look like, <laughs> he didn't look like any of the people from Saudi He looked like the people from Kuwait, the dark ones. He looked like the people from Oman, Qatar, and he was definitely a Sudanese. Go ahead, you have Okay. Um. Yes, that's, that's true. Uh, even uh, Prophet Esau, may Allah be pleased with him, was of uh, African descent. Okay, and uh, it's also true that as far as uh, if you want to get, um, I don't know if they call it, um, something about the study of the past, the people that be digging up fossils and whatnot. At, uh, anthropology. Anthropology, you know, if you want to get anthropology. Yeah, sure. Uh, the earliest signs of existence was found in Ethiopia, Africa, dating back millions of years ago. When the borderline of Sudan, you're right. Yeah, long, before, long before the white man was even here. The uh, Europeans even came on the scene. You're right. Well, this is a known factor. Uh, yeah. But my point is that. Um, uh, Let me we, ask you a question. Do you, do you think that white people as a whole, as a whole, are just the black people in the world, knowing that? Slavery just got abolished in Mecca in 1968. You know that, right? It just abolished slavery in Mecca in 1968. Did you know that? Oh, I also know that the uh, uh, the, uh, the Arabs, uh, as that what they're just what they're getting to, that they enslaved uh, blacks, uh, Africans, yeah. uh, long before the Europeans even came on the scene. If that's what you're getting at. No, I wasn't. I wasn't uh, getting that at all. Because the, the original Arabs that they're speaking about being enslaved was the family of the Prophet Muhammad called the Fatimites, oh. and Ali and Hassan was the family of Muhammad when, when um, Rasulullah refused to let Abu Bakr Sadiq, who the Sunnis called the first Khalifa, marry his daughter Fatima, and then the same day gave her to Ali, Imer al-Mu'minin, his uncle's son, Abu uh, Talib's son, the white Arabs became angry at the black Arabs, and when Rasulullah Muhammad died, Alayhi salatu wasalam, while Ali and Fatima and the rest of them and Bilal were performing his janazah, 
Abu Bakr and al Abbas and them was in another city voting for who should be the successor. And they weren't even at his funeral. And then when they put Abu Bakr Sadiq in because he had the most money and he was a light Arab, Aisha's father who made her own Haditha, right? then they turned on the family of Fatima and Ali and them and Hassan and Hussein and killed them. And then chased the family out of Arabia up into Egypt, why if you go to Cairo where the University of Azhar is, there's a mosque called Masjid of Hussein there. They chased the family up there and then they moved down into Sudan. Um, getting to, I'm referring to the autobiography of Malcolm X. Yes. You know, when he went on his hatch, yes. he said that <laughs> he had, uh, you know, and if this statement that he said isn't any good, you need to take down that picture I should that you have, but he said that he slept eight and drank out of cups of people who were here with the wine, with the you know, the next thing I'm going to tell you is going to surprise you. With the, um, the next thing I'm going to tell you is going to surprise you. What, that there was a change of mind? No, I was there with him. Yeah? I was on Hajj? I was on Hajj. Come to Wait. At Jizzle with him. I am one of the Sudanese brothers. When he says in the autobiography, there was a short, dark skinned guy with slanted eyes who was give me all my advice, a young man. He's talking about me. I was the one there. And Malcolm X never ever made 90% of the statements that appeared in that autobiography. Yes. He got mad at the Honorable Elijah Muhammad because his own brother, not Elijah Muhammad's brother, Malcolm X's brother wanted to kill him because of things that he let Wallace D. Muhammad put in his head against the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. It wasn't the Honorable Elijah Muhammad who was trying to kill Malcolm X. It was Malcolm X's own blood brother. And I have this on videotape where you can hear him talking about himself wanting to kill his own brother because he should know better than to speak out against the messenger because he said he should know that if the messenger wanted him dead, he would have been dead by now. But Malcolm X fell victim to what he accused other black, other black political leaders of, and that was letting a white man tell him what to think. You follow that? Okay, he was, but okay, so, let me so then, what was his right, real right. feeling? Right, right, right. Well, it's pertaining to the you issue. Right, right. What was his real feeling? What was his real feeling about European people. He said, and I quote, and you can check it. He said, when I got over there, I saw what they would call white people in America praying and being humble. But I knew that they were not white people no more. They were Muslim. And if the white people in America could become Muslims, then we would have a peaceful world. But notice how he phrased that. He said, I saw them over there, and they no longer look like white people. Where they have blonde hair and blue eyes. They didn't look like white people. They just became Muslim. And mm. if and if, he said, the white people in America would become Muslim, then they would also drop that racist thing. Mm -hmm. If. But he also, being a student of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, was confronted with a question that is, can the devil be reformed? And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, no, not nowadays. And this is what Malcolm was saying. Agreed. And I agree with you. If, if all the white people in the world were to become Muslims and serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make their constitution the Holy Quran and make their capital the holy city of Mecca, then the world would be at peace. But the question again there is if. And I know and you know that Adnan Khashoggi left Islam to become an American. He was an Arab. Would the Ansar community accept the uh, European Shahada? I said a hundred thousand times that I would accept a European Shahada. I said a hundred thousand times that if a, a white man or a white woman came to me in distress, I would help them. See, people, they have no, feelings. No, Shahada. I ain't no lie. I want to come. I said, I believe you. I said, oh, okay. la ilaha illallah wahtahu la shurika lahu. You talking about that? And live in the community? Yes, but they cannot marry into our blood. Why? Because if we do that, the next generation, the Quran, where Allah says, I made you into tribes and families so that you may know about each other. If we mingle and we don't have tribes and families no more, then people will be able to say the Quran has a contradiction in it. Because they'll see everybody one race, and they'll say, this book that y'all follow says, I made you into tribes and families so that you may know about each other. I've seen black people from integration, and it took me a while to figure out whether they were black or white. I'm quite sure you have too. We got to make sure the Quran stays unadulterated and pure. And if Allah says, he made us into different hues and colors, that he wants us to keep these hues and colors. He said he made us into separate tribes and families, that he wants us to keep these tribes and families. So we can worship together, we can laugh together, we can break bread together, but we should not mix our seed with them. That's what I teach. And uh, people so, are interpreting it and calling me a racist because I call white people what they are, the way they call us. They call you a Zinji quick in Arabic, which means bigger. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, if I may, brother, no, do you say Pleasure to talk to you. What's your name? Ibrahim. Ibrahim, it's a pleasure to meet you. Yes, it's my pleasure. Yeah, yeah. what I want to ask, I... Say like if you were an Orthodox Muslim, besides being black, you were like in a country like Pakistan or whatever, Afghanistan, or 
like the so-called brothers of Bangladesh. They're like, um, you had green eyes or whatever, blue eyes, and you, and you study the scriptures and, and you, you know, you pray five times a day. Are you entitled to go to Jannah? Only Allah Ta'ala can decide that, who goes to Jannah. All we can do is point out the facts of the scriptures. When it comes down to making decisions on who goes to Jannah and who doesn't, Allah does that. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Though in the Holy Quran, in the uh, 20th chapter, the 102nd verse, he does refer to them as already accused. You see, on the day when a trumpet is blown, we shall gather the guilty. He's using them as if they're already found guilty. If you notice that when you read it, right? And it's not, and it's not in a future tense, it's already past. We will gather the guilty. When he speaks about the devil, he says, Undorni, watch me until the day of judgment. Which means Allah already found him guilty for not bowing to Adam, but he asked Allah to respite him as they translated, or to watch him, and he says, I'll grant you that. Which means the devil is already found guilty. So whatever nationality, because of integration, that the devil pops up in, and believe it, he has integrated into every nationality. Whatever race he has mixed himself into, whether he's speaking Spanish, French, or American Negro English, and he's the devil in our midst, and he has made it his business to integrate into our midst, on the day when a trumpet is blown, he shall be gathered separately than those righteous. We now have available another 24 hours of two nights of my top ten men. Our men are teaching the school to die, and some hidden among Ethan and Hattie and Mahdi, as the Olympic treasure and enlightenment, a total of 48 hours of two nights of answering all those questions and not having the census to only get the answer. Something that's not a Why use the books of the New Testament? Is Allah's name Jehovah? The two hundred fallen angels, which Jesus you follow, and much, much more. I used to be a follower of the Honorable Elias Muhammad until he died. Then I became a follower of his son, Wallace D. Muhammad. But I came to find out that he was not teaching the same thing as the messenger. Wallace D. Muhammad teaches that you can work for anybody, even the white man who is the devil. Wallace D. Muhammad teaches that the white man is not, even though the scriptures say the white man is the devil. Then I started reading books written by Imam Isa, and he explains the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's teachings better than anybody I've ever heard, even Minister Farrakhan. Imam Isa teaches the importance of doing for self, just like Elijah taught us. Imam Isa also has his followers dressing in the garb of the prophet, like the Quran says. I used to call myself a black Israelite Jew, because I thought I was from the tribe of Levi. And nobody could tell me different. Then I finally read one of Elie Mamisa's books, and I found out that the Israelites never called themselves Jews, that they were all destroyed, except for the tribes of Judah and Dan, and that in the Old Testament, the books of Moses, it does speak about Muhammad. And thanks to Elie Mamisa, I now know that I'm an Ishmaelite, and that we should follow all of the scriptures. And now, let us return to our broadcast. Shaitan, he is Shaitan, <laughs> just uh -huh. acting like he's something he's not. And believe me, one of the best acts the devil puts on is the preacher and the teacher and the leaders. They come as Muslims and put on white robes. The Quran says they sit out there and they listen to the recitation of the Quran and then they pervert it. Okay? They come as Muslims, saying they have faith in the law in the last day, but they are not. When they're with you, they say they are faithful, but then when they get back to their satanic friends, the Quran literally says that. When they get back to their satanic friends, then they tell their satanic friends that they were only making fun and making a mockery. So remember this, the devil is in many different disguises. He's weaved himself into everybody's race. You go to Puerto Rico, you find blonde hair, blue eyes, stand right there speaking Spanish. And if you go to Mauritius, you're going to find him intermingling in Mauritius, Mauritania, and even in Sudan now, my son. We got a whole bunch of them sit up there, Sudanese, looking blonde hair and blue eyes because they're married in. Because the men, when they got into power and political positions, they started marrying European women and mixing their seeds. That's what the devil has over us. He knows how to assimilate himself into us. You understand? Yeah. If you turn to the Holy Quran in the second chapter, in the uh, 13th verse. And when it said to them, have the same faith as the people before you, Malachi Ibrahim, they say, shall we have the faith of fools? Now surely they are the biggest fools 
but they don't know it. Okay, and when they meet those who, who have faith, they say, we have faith also. And when they, the way are left alone with their physical devils, they say to them, surely we are with you, and we are only mocking and them. And the idle word is, Ila, Shariya, Sinidim. And these are the words, Shaytan, right there. You see that? It says, Wa ila, Laku al-Ladina Amanu, Kalu Amana, Wa ila, Kalu, Ila, Shariya, Sinidim. Kalu, Inna, Makum, Inna, Ma, Nahnu, Mustaziyun. You see that? And when they meet with those who are faithful, follow. They say, Amina, I am of the faithful. I am a mu'min, a believer, a faithful person. And when they return, Ila, to their shaitanic friends, follow. They say to them, Inna, surely, ma'kum. I am in a company of yours. Inna, ma, all I was really doing, all we were really doing, was mocking or making fun of the Muslim. So you better be careful of people who come to you and say, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. And they go and leave you and turn right to Shaitan, the devil himself, and say, I'm really one of your people. They went out with the Muslim guys pretending I was with them. Don't think because a person says they're Muslim and wears white that they're Muslim. In fact, we have a campaign right now in this community that we're putting a stop to brothers who are on the street dressed as us, pretending to be Ansar and have their women out there with them with veils on and their kids out there, which is not our teaching. But we're going to stop niggas from being on the street Playing with women, smoking cigarettes, doing all kinds of stuff, and the public thinks they're us. They're on the subway, and they're begging up money, and it's not, it has nothing to do with our community, and they're selling stuff, they're getting it from people, and it's, when you meet a brother who tries to sell you something, you ask him, do you live inside the community, yes or no? Do you live inside the community on Bushwick Avenue, yes or no? He says no, then tell him you are whooping sheep clothing. Do y'all hear me? You people that want to hear me? If you meet a brother on that street selling something, he's trying to sell you something or, or solicit funds from you, you ask him, do you live inside the Ansar community, yes or no? You understand? And if he tells you no, then you are a woman who keeps close with a lot of these brothers, use our doctrine to pull women. They wouldn't have no conversation any other way. So you use Ansar all our teachings and they pretend they're with us and they sit around their tables all day talking to women. And we are going to put a stop to that stuff because a lot of that is not represented in our doctrine. And a lot of men get bypassed. A brother standing out there, he got questions, and he can't get a conversation in because the brother spent all his time talking to women at the table. We call through Jamaica Avenue, 42nd Street, and all the different places where these guys are set up. And I know some of you people see brothers at their tables spend their whole day just talking to women. We're going to put a stop there because they're out there probably spreading the word, the dawah of the Mahdi, and trying to raise people's souls out there flirting with women. So you, and you women, you be careful those brothers out there professing to be inside here, and they don't want you to come in. They keep you outside, and they visit you, because there's nowhere in our law that says a brother from inside the mosque can go to your house and visit you. That is not our law. He's not allowed to go to your house and eat in your house. He's not allowed to take money from you, and there's no such thing as he can have sex with you because he's planning on marrying you in the near future. If some brother tell you that, he is a liar. And I want you people to do me a favor and spread this, what I'm saying now. You understand? Because there's a lot of bad things happening because brothers are perpetrating some lies. And I want y'all to go out there and tell people that if that brother's coming to your house, he doesn't belong there. That's not the law. No brother in the Ansar community is allowed to go to some woman's house who's not in the mob. That's against our law. If he's spending night in your house, he, is, he knows that he's, he, that he's bringing shame to you. He knows he's disrespecting you. Put your foot down in the name of the law. Okay? Do you hear me? Yeah. Does everybody know what I'm saying? Yeah. I hope I didn't upset nobody, but yeah. this is something that must be done. Because a lot of perpetrators out there, what's in she Um, Just to elaborate on what he said, someone had approached my, my husband went and asked um, someone dressed in white, and he was uh, he had women with him, my so-called wives, and uh, my husband asked him about the community, and he started to say derogatory things about the community. And uh, he also told my husband that he doesn't live in the community, so I guess maybe that's what, he was probably one of those people that's exactly the kind of thing, because we would never have our women on the street with all that danger, selling no, not selling no uh, products or whatever. And we think it's, our women should be protected, not out there. You understand what I'm saying? A Muslim woman or any woman, for that matter, whether she's Muslim or not, should be respected and not allowed to stand out on those street pellets. We see brothers like that, and they get mad because we tell, we tell them, you're disrespecting your own wife. And I'm sorry that she doesn't have enough sense to see that, that, she, that you're subjecting her to a lot of danger. All these crazy people out here, all these crazy Jews, somebody, some, some snipers go up a, a hotel in, in Israel and some fool runs up and thinks you an eyes and starts hitting you in your head with something or hits your wife. Then you got to kill him on the street and then you're in jail. 
and it's all over. Your wife's in jail, your kids in some home, and it ain't working. We gotta build communities now, and we gotta learn to train ourselves and get prepared for survival. We gotta teach our women to prepare themselves. We've got to get ready for what's gonna happen in the very near future. And if y'all don't get ready, y'all gonna be some sorry people, because the white man is ready. He got his thing organized. When he go down to the village and beat up white kids, you know what he do to black kids. He went to the, uh, I think it's the East, East Village, and whipped a whole bunch of white people in the head with sticks. So you know what he do to you. <laughs> Go ahead, sister. Oh, okay. Excuse me for interrupting you. That's all right. Um, if white people are cursed, or the cursed race, why, why waste time accepting them into the nation of Islam? Is it I, I didn't say that I do. I said if a white person came to me, and let me show you how I explained it. Okay. There's people sitting in that class who've been coming to our class for years asking questions, black, and never move in. You follow that? Yeah. They okay. just absorb the knowledge and they got an excuse every year for why they're not in. So I said, if a white person came to that mic and asked, could I move in? I say yes, because there's black people sitting inside there who should be trying to build from the inside out that won't. And I say that person got more faith than the brother and sister who's sitting inside there just using and adopting to get over on a day-to-day -day basis. That's how I explained it. Oh. I also follow by saying to brother that I do not believe that the devil can ever be reformed. You see that? Um, he is the devil, was the devil, and always will be the devil. There's no reformation for the devil. So, you know what I'm saying? So if he's here, he definitely can't intermarry. And if white people are here can't intermarry, they only have one generation of survivors. If they can't marry, they will fade away. You understand? Um, what is the Plus, what do you mean? One more thing. Plus, because of genetics, if every black person in the world married a white person, there'd yeah. be no more white people. Because the kids born to black and white are considered black. Right. So if any black person wouldn't marry a white person, we'd get rid of them in one generation. But we have so many diseases, it would take us another ten generations to get rid of the diseases. <laughs> so we can't reform them. Okay, go ahead. Uh, okay. Um, what is your teaching or the Muslim teaching on reincarnation? I'm glad you brought that question up because we're the only community that will address this problem. Most Muslims, if you go to them and try it, visit them, and ask them they believe in reincarnation, they'll go, no, that's a Hindu belief, and it's wrong. And then they'll tell you that Jesus is coming back. They'll say in the Hadith, the Prophet Muhammad said, Jesus will come in the last day, and he'll ascend in a physical form, they say, in their teaching, in an orange robe in Jerusalem. All right? Now, if Jesus was here on earth, and according to them, Allah took him up, which means he left his physical plane, or for simple word, he died. Correct? Yes. Sir. And if Jesus is going to come back in a latter day in a physical form to take the head of the job and to break the cross, then Muslims in a quiet kind of way believe in the word reincarnation. Because all it means is to reincarnate, to come back in a physical body. But if you ask them they believe in reincarnation because of brainwashing by Hindus, they'll say, no, we don't believe in reincarnation immediately before they think out what you're saying. If you believe that the Messiah Jesus is going to return in the latter day to claim his people, then you believe in reincarnation. So if you ask me, do I believe in reincarnation? Yes, I do believe that Moses and Elijah reincarnated to Jesus and spoke to him. Yes, I do believe that Elijah returned in John the Baptist uh, in the scriptures. And yes, I believe when Rasulullah taught us that Jesus will come in the latter day in a physical form, so yes, I do believe in reincarnation. I don't believe, however, that we come back as fishes and birds and ducks and snakes and all that kind of stuff. I don't believe we can regress. I think we can only go forward because we're going towards becoming one with the Creator. So I don't think we can go back. Okay? Okay. But how about a person like me, just the average person? Well, so-called average person. I think that if you don't build up enough cousin with certain people called karma, while in this life, you will come back to in another life. I know that human beings do not just live 80 years and die. There's too much in the universe that must be obtained and too little time in them 80 years. If I write extraterrestrials live thousands of years and some trillions of years, they've lost the sense of time. But what happened is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the beginning of the book of your book called Genesis, he put in time by the creation of the sun, moon, and stars, and it put you all in a vacuum of time where you have durations of existence and seasons and uh, of if you follow, but beings on the outside, angelic beings who live outside of the Earth's atmosphere are not subject to your time laws, and therefore they have infinite life, or what Jesus, or Muhammad, or Moses call eternal life. So I believe, yes, you yourself have lived other lives. And with the proper regression, you can go back to those other lives. 
And most times, if you catch a kid like five years old, you can sit down and talk to them, ask them questions, and they can tell you about previous lives that they've lived. Little kids, if you, if you know how to question them. And adults with a person who knows what they're doing can be put into a uh, hypnotic progression and go back and experience previous lives. Everybody you see has lived multiple lives before. Yes. Okay? Uh, okay. So it is too old for the, for the body. Go ahead. What? I didn't hear it. I, I said the spirit is a heck of a lot over in the body. Oh, I see. Um, uh, uh, there's another question. Oh, okay. So when exactly what age is he supposed to make his appearance? Who? He's the supposed, devil? Yeah, he's 22. He'll be about 22 now. The devil came out of the pit, the first pit, in 1966. Right. All right? He's going to be locked away again for a thousand years. And that thousand years can be one day. Because one day, like, to the Lord, like a thousand years, thousand, depending on us and our faith. If we don't perform the circle, now listen, close people. If we don't perform the circle, which gives us the power to pull down the walls of Jericho again, we will be vulnerable to Satan. What made Israel have the power to pull down the walls of Jericho is they came together and they chanted and they vickered. They vickered along to find out his name together in a circle. They formed a camp and set up the altar of the tabernacle and they prayed together and they worshiped together. And then they went down to Jericho and they marched on the city and they brought it down. You remember that? Well, we can't do it because like Israel, Israel, you Israelites won't come to the camp. We won't get together. So the devil will be loose on us. And if he's loose on us, we have serious problems. So we have the power. You ain't kidding, because right like that room, if people sitting there talking to us, and you maybe, who ain't coming home. We'll be talking for months. I'm going to come. I think he's right. He might be telling the truth. You ain't never heard them like this before. You ain't never seen these many facts before. Have a lot of fun about that ever provided you all with so many facts? Book after book, numbers, quotes, dates, names, places, maps, science, but so many facts. Have you ever brought out so many facts before? Never before. But still you won't come home. Still you stay out there and wobble in the mire. And meanwhile, the devil and the beast is organizing. Okay? Um, I know there's 19 other galaxies, and some planets have been destroyed, but how do they... Wait a minute. Huh? There's 19 galaxies in Theta. What's that? Theta is where Yannin comes from. There's Zeta, Theta, Alpha, Beta. These are Greek names that were given to the different star formations in other galaxies. There's 19 galaxies within the star formation of where Yanun comes from. Oh, and he just happens to come from the eighth planet called Risk of a three-sun galaxy, which is one of the 19. When you get into Zeta, or what they call Zeta-1, right, that's another star, star formation, and they have many galaxies there. <laughs> Okay? It's much com more complicated oh, than much more complicated. just that, yeah. <laughs> well, all right, I just wanted to ask you, what do extraterrestrials look like? I mean, you see these um, on television, you see little green eyed monsters, but do they actually look like that or really more like us? I understand what you're saying. Are you with me? Let me explain something to you about that extraterrestrial thing. Uh -huh. When an extraterrestrial visits Terra, Terra is one of the names of the planet Earth used by extraterrestrials. Mm -hmm. The project planet Earth is called Urenda, if you ever get a chance to remember. And Jesus, by the way, is on a starship, and his starship name is Senender. Okay? He's not called Jesus or the Messiah, he's called Senender. But let me go on. If an extraterrestrial ship, as you call it, comes into the earth and lands, correct? Mm -hmm. For the first time, and he lands in a jungle, and he encounters a lion, what do you think he'll think? That that's an earthling. What? you think that the lion is an earthling. Yeah. If he encounters, a, if he goes beneath the earth into the sea, like the vortex do, when they come here, they go under the sea, what will he think when he sees under the sea? He'll think those are earthlings. Yeah. See, what's wrong with people on the planet Earth? They tend to think that they're the only earthlings. We are the human beings. We are the rulers of the planet Earth. When in reality, oh. every living creature from insect to ant to bacteria is an earthling. And therefore, different forms of extraterrestrials, depending on the ladder of their intellect and, and existence, come to Earth. There are bacteria that come to visit bacteria. There are humanoids that come here. The ones that frequent the planet Earth the most, right, Uranian, are what they refer to as the little people. Mm -hmm. They frequent most here, and that's because back in 1947, 
one of their ships crashed here because of a, a storm. And they worked off uh, electricity magnets. And when they came back to uh, recover the bodies of the wreck, they encountered certain American officials, Truman in particular, who all they asked for was the bodies and the remainings of the wreckage to take back. And, he made a, and they, they made him make a bargain with them to give them certain diseases and certain formulas like energy equals mass times the speed of light and his formula of Flint Adams for the atomic bomb, which they told the extraterrestrials they were going to use for something good, but in turn used for something evil. And they didn't return all of the bodies, and they didn't return all of, all of the uh, wreckage, so the extraterrestrials, uh, to what they call celebrity, put Truman out of his misery, and Eisenhower picked it up. Eisenhower came into office, and he became the one who was a negotiator for a certain project whose name I won't mention. And he became a communicator between the extraterrestrials then. You follow that? Yeah, follow and he also betrayed them. They gave y'all the cure for cerebral palsy. They gave y'all the cure for polio. They gave y'all the, uh, they got a vaccine for um, cholera and for malaria. And they, were, and they would have given you the cure for cancer and all the other diseases, but they betrayed these beings and killed them, the ones who visited. And so then they, other, other beings came from other galaxies because it's an interplanetary thing of other galaxies who came here from other forms of life, for lack of a better word, to assist these the little people who are really just scientists. They're different formations of stars. Some beings come here as scientists. They're more apt to take you up on a ship and examine you to find out how your organs work, find out how your brain works, because mortals on Earth are only using a fraction of their brain. Certain planets where the people have evoluted for millions and millions of years, they use their whole brain. And human beings, for some reason, have stopped as you were evoluting in the beginning of your time, thousands of years ago, you were becoming smarter and beginning to use more of your brain, and that was giving you more psychic powers. But uh, wicked extraterrestrials have taught human beings how to use computers, which made their brain stop developing. And if you don't develop your brain, you're going to cut off your psychic power, and y'all won't have telepathy and all of the powers necessary for communicating with extraterrestrials. So now you're doing everything on computers, and you stop developing the brain. So the extraterrestrials are concerned, but you're so fascinated with the computers and how fast they get things done that they can't convince you that thousands of years are being lost because human beings are not calculating with their hands and not developing their minds and not studying things from an esoteric standpoint of view, but they're looking at everything from a monetary and physical standpoint of view. So they foresee that planet Earth is about to destroy itself because man has gotten more sophisticated with his technology than he has in his spiritual powers. So they sent the Quran, they sent the Torah, they sent the Injil, they through telepathy have communicated with certain mortals like Muhammad and Zoroastrian and Buddha and Musa and Esau, well, Esau is a different creature because he was caught between two worlds, and communicated with them and tried to send down this information so that they can teach you and get you developed spiritually for when the mothership comes, which you read in Revelation 21 as the crystal city that Jesus said will come out of heaven with the 24 elders which Ezekiel saw, but you're not ready for it. You're caught up in the physical things and the luxuries of the world, and you're being persuaded by the cherubim to, to lean towards the darker side of things instead of by the seraphim to lean towards the lighter side. So to answer your question, many different types of beings are coming to this planet. The most important visitation was around 1947, after you bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, because you almost, with two atoms, split your planet. And if you would have split your planet, you would have interfered with things that are being done in the center of the planet in a place called Wahala and Shambhala. So the extraterrestrials started sending people from the vortex that went into the bottom of the Bermuda Triangle, which opens up 19 times a year. You understand that? It opens the way to a fourth generation. And they come in the vortex of, of being from the same galaxy as the little people, but they, are, they live underwater as opposed to on land. And they come here, when, uh, they're living under, under the sea here, in the Atlantic Ocean and different places, and they have empires there. And everybody is working to keep you from destroying the planet so y'all can develop. The only thing that cannot be done is they cannot interfere with the natural course of your planet. Because it will be thrown into a star holocaust, meaning the magnetic field of the planet will be reduced, which y'all are doing anyway by removing the ozone layer. And we're trying to figure out any way we possibly can to re nick the ozone layer because if the ozone layer is moving up to by the waves coming, you have 10 years before your planet will be destroyed. So as the church is doing everything in their power to keep you from destroying yourself, and the cherubims are here in the form of human beings, and y'all just don't see them as they're white people, and they're doing everything in their power to destroy you. Let me give you a little cue. He's the man says try to drive at 55 miles an hour, and he makes a car that does 260. Don't smoke cigarettes, and they got cigarette commercials. 
Alcohol will kill you, they got alcohol commercials. Drugs that kill you, they import drugs in the country. You can't even smuggle a piece of jewelry in from South America, but they can't stop hundreds of pounds of drugs. There's obviously an inward conspiracy for human beings to destroy themselves out of their ignorance. And extraterrestrials are not allowed to intervene. They can only suggest or through telepathy or influence certain human beings to make them react certain ways or just incarnate and teach like in my case. I was assigned here to teach you to try to raise your consciousness so that when the ship comes, you'll be ready. But I'm having such a hard time because you don't believe nothing I say because I'm not white. You believe the, the cherubims and everything they teach. If the white man came on the day and said, I made all this up, you all would believe it. With all the facts that I taught and every scripture and every verification, you still say, I knew there's something wrong with him all the time. It's that easy. The same way Malcolm X was easily influenced by the cherubim to turn against Elijah Muhammad. It's that easy. And that's holding y'all back. You have got to get back into using your calculus ability. You've got to get back into using your psychic powers. You people have psychic powers. How many times have you thought about calling somebody and you picked up the phone and they were there? How many times have you thought about seeing a friend that you haven't seen and turned the corner and they were standing there? How many times have you walked up on a person and said, I know this person, I don't know from where. These are people you know in your spiritual life. You better get your spiritual life together and get away from this physical thing because it is swiftly passing away. And whether Sananda, who you know as Jesus, or Elias, Elijah, or whoever comes to try to teach you, all you do is get intimidated, cross-examine them, curse them, defame them, question them, doubt them, butcher them, and then try to either kill them or chase them away. And the Quran says, you people will kill your own messages. They try to kill the Messiah Jesus for what he was trying to teach you. Some of you people know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all think I'm nuts. Some of you people have had extraterrestrial communication. Some of you people have had extraterrestrial dreams and visions. Some of you people know that you don't belong on this plane and other people don't know it. Some of y'all are mortal, and some of y'all are supreme beings. And the ones in there that are supreme beings inside, they know what I'm saying is true. They don't know how to get back because they've fallen so far, but they know there's something not normal about the way they feel, and the way things happen to them, and the way life is set up around them, and they know that people are out to hurt them, and situations always work against them. When they try to tell people, people say, oh, you're just paranoid. When you go to get a job, and they pick the other person standing next to you, and you say, damn, these people just don't like me. And then you go home and say, that's just paranoia. There's no paranoia. The devil knows who you are. And he sees it in your eyes even where you can't see it. And he's out to stop you. And he will block everything you want to do. He'll make your life totally miserable. When there's five people to get picked in the college, you'll have the highest credentials and you won't be the one to pick. You understand? When the bus gets away, when you're coming out of the street, the bus is pulled off. Everybody else catches the bus. The bus gets away from you. You understand what I'm saying? You get down there and someone says, boy, the train just left. I'm sorry, that was our last pair of green shoes. And, you be, and then you don't realize that this has been happening to you your whole life. Then you sit back and say, why does everything always happen to me? That's because you are a visitor. You understand? You're a seed of the elders and you're lost here. And you better wake up soon. Because when the devil opens up the door against you, he's not going to show no mercy.